Hello and welcome to the Wisdom Cricket Weekly podcast. Alex Hales, Luke Wood and Harry Brook all impressed as England went 1-0 up against Pakistan in Pakistan. Darren Stevens signed off his Kent career by winning the Royal London One Day Cup. We're ever closer to knowing who will win the county championship. The T20 World Cup squads are basically all out and Australia beat India in an epic T20i last night. I'm Yaz Rana and to cover all of that and more is the magazine editor of Wisdom Cricket Monthly, Joe Harmon. The editor-in-chief of Wisden Cricket Monthly, Phil Walker, and the managing editor of Wisden.com, Ben Gardner. But first, let's head to Mark Butcher, who I spoke to after the first Pakistan-England T20i last night. Um, we're joined by Mark Butcher from his his palace in Karachi. Um, Mark, what's it like being in Pakistan for this tour? It's obviously the first time that England have been out there for 17 years. What's it like? What's the security around uh, the whole event been like? It's been... Well, it's been as you'd expect, actually. I mean, I, the last time I was in Pakistan was um, for the 2020 edition of the PSL. And that got split because of COVID. So we were here just leading up to the finals in March. Um, and then all of a sudden COVID hit and all of the Australian and New Zealand players, of which there were plenty, all had to, to try and get flights out and back home. Otherwise, they were going to get locked out of their countries. I mean, doesn't that sound like a bizarre thing to say um, two years later? And then I went back in, they rearranged the finals um, for November. So that, that was the last time I was here. And and we were under, we had presidential, you know, the, that was the, the, the name of the of the, the protocol. We were under president, presidential security then, and it's not much different now. Um, one thing, I suppose, from the player's point of view anyway, is that... The, the, they're all quite happy because they're allowed to they're allowed to leave their rooms. You know, they're allowed to wander around the hotel. They've got a team room. They've got a golf simulator. They're, they're all quite happy. Um, they don't feel as though their freedoms have been taken away because they weren't used to things being much, much worse, i.e. they couldn't leave their rooms at all. But it's fine. Um, hospitality, incredible. People, very, very warm. Um, can't do enough for you. Delighted that we're here. Um, and so we're all, uh, we're all very, very good and, good. Uh, and very happy to be in Pakistan. Just off the television, the atmosphere in the ground looked amazing. The the cheers for each single that Babar and Rizwan hit early on was like a, like a boundary or someone reaching a century. Oh, don't be like that. <laughs> don't be like that. I mean, yeah, okay. So there's a bit of shade being thrown there. They, no, they, it, well, no genuinely, actually, it wasn't. It was amazing. It was. It was the the noise was brilliant. That wasn't said sarcastically. I I genuinely thought it was great. No, no, no. I thought you were throwing shade on Babar and Riz, Rizwan, no. not the crowd. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> Um, no, they were. It was yeah. It was really good. I mean, you know, they've had cricket back here. Obviously, Australia were, were the first team to come back. Um, but the, the ties, I suppose, between Pakistan and England, um, albeit sort of, you know, in, in some cases colonial, in some cases, in lots of cases ancestral. Now, familial because you know, Moeen Ali being a, a, a case in point. Um, there are so many things that bind sort of England and Pakistan, and whilst the um, the rivalry on field can sometimes spill over into sort of bad blood. The players have always, always got on incredibly well um, between the two teams. I, I think back to sort of the relationships between, um, you know, my generation of players. So Alex Stewart and Razi Akram, they were pinging messages back, back and forth to one another while the game was on, you know, saying hi and, you know, remembering me- remembering the good times and all that kind of stuff. So the, the, the relationships last for a long time. And it felt like that in the ground. You know, there were people hold, holding up Union Jacks. Um, huge round of applause after the um, after the national anthems. Um, and, and if you think back to October or September last year when England were meant to come and, and England rather let, in a lot of people's views and in mine in particular at the time as well, was that, that England let Pakistan down by not coming on that tour. Um, after Pakistan had come over and bailed England out um, during during COVID in, in 2020, um, you you would imagine that there would be sort of a, a hangover of um, you know animosity or whatever or uh, between uh, the the people and you know the Union Jack and the England team and all that kind of stuff. Not a bit of it. They kind of um, welcomed England. They applauded the national anthem. There's been a lot of sympathy over the death of the Queen and all that kind of stuff. And um, you know, and the England team have, have 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 done well to try and reciprocate by, you know, by pledging money, you know, by donating towards the the uh, the flood relief fund and all that kind of stuff. So, it it appears as a massive love in. Everyone is is very very happy to see one another. 
um, and it's wonderful that old hostilities, um, friendships and rivalries can resume. Mm. Um, the ball didn't do that much today and one England bowler that really impressed was Luke Wood on debut, uh, a bit quicker than the other left armers on show. Um, I, I fear that some of the games in this series in the longness of time will be forgotten. So, um, But today, I thought he did really, really well. Um, what do you think he gives compared to the other guys England have at the moment? Because it, him, him and Gleeson were, were quite a lot quicker than, than Willie and Curran. Yeah. Um, I, I've been a massive fan of Luke Woods for quite a, a long period of time. You know, from back in his Nottinghamshire days before he moved to Lanx and, and whatever else. Because he has a he has a real quality about him, particularly with the new ball, which he didn't have today. Um, to be able to swing the ball at pace, tack the stumps, you know, to rush rush good players, hit the stumps often, hit pads often. Um, and, um, you know, he also has quite a lot of skill at the death. And he's like a 150% player, you know, to coin a, an awful footballism. But he is, he kind of, you know, every every day seems like it's a, a great adventure to him and he kind of runs in and, and gives gives it everything. He also, his resemblance to... Um, Rick Mayo's Lord Flashart is also something that has endeared me to him over the years. Uh, and so it, it didn't surprise me that he was able to sort of go out there and perform in that manner um, for England on his debut. He, you know, he's not a young man anymore. He's been around the traps a bit, so he knows what he's doing. And um, and, it, and if England should ever need somebody, if one of the many um, sort of first choice for, uh, players for England don't make it in terms of their fitness, um, even by the end of this tour or they break down again or whatever, then they've got a guy there that, that they would be able to rely upon um, should needs be. He has a lot of really good qualities, particularly in, in these conditions, actually, because he's, he's quick through the air, swings the ball, can reverse it, decent bumper. Um, and 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 he will he will try it no matter what. You know, there's no lost causes for Luke Wood. Hmm. Um, you, you've long been a fan of Harry Brook. You were you were singing his praises uh, for much of last summer before he got his first England call up. Uh, it's been a long time that we can say about an English batter that they really like batting in Pakistan. He had a really good PSL and brilliant here. It's almost a shame that he didn't play more international cricket in the home summer. But today was exactly the kind of thing we've been seeing from him in T20 cricket around the world for for a couple of years now. How impressed were you? Do you, do you think he's someone who could potentially force his way into England's first choice eleven for the for the World Cup in Australia? Yeah, potentially. Um, I, I was really imp- what I was impressed with him about today was uh, in in previous England outings, whether that be in the, the Caribbean, albeit he was my, massively out of position playing there. Um, and then again, in, you know, in the test match this summer, there was a kind of, there was a, a skittishness and a, a kind of, a, it was almost like being too eager to please, I suppose. Show everybody every trick that you've got in your bag um, within the first three seconds of meeting them. Whereas tonight, I thought he played, just played magnificently. You know, there was a wonderful touch. There was that awesome stroke over, inside out, over the top of um, mid-off. Uh, and, and it all seemed to be very much under control. He had all the time in the world. Um, and, and was owning the stage, I suppose. And when you think that Alex Hales was at the other end, other end, um, and Harry Brook is out, is the outstanding man in the partnership, then that gives you some sort of an idea as to how well he's played. So he's come on an enormous amount. Um, there's a, there's a maturity there, or at least there was on show today. Anyhow, um, it, he looked like he was in control of everything that was happening. The events weren't controlling him; he was controlling them. And that is the type of player that I think he's going to be going forward. So. Um, it was it was great to, great to watch tonight, and it would have had you know, some of those people who can't stand T Twenty because it's all about slogging and stuff would have would have rather enjoyed watching Harry Brook tonight. Mm. Yeah, I liked how calm he was. He uh, the way in him and Hales battered in the middle overs, they were complete confidence, their ability to catch up uh, late in the innings against the Quicks, and they came back on. Um, just finally, you alluded to it earlier. Babar and Rizwan have come under quite a lot of criticism in the last few months about their approach at the top of the innings. Today, it wasn't quite the same level, but in how the rest of the Pakistan batting order batted, do you kind of see why they've been slower in the last six months? Because actually, if you look, if you look at the last two years since they've been, o- been opening together, they were quicker in their first year or so opening. And now with the middle order, yeah. like it is now, no Malik, no Hafiz, they, they seem to be taking fewer risks than they were um, 12 or so months ago. Yeah, I, I actually thought that they... 
that they remedy not remedy that, but at least come out with it with a little, little bit more um, with a little bit more intent maybe this evening as a as a repost to all that criticism. And you know, it, it's difficult for people when you're scoring that many runs and it appears as though you're doing your job very well. It's kind of hard to take people having to go at you when nobody else can score a run. But but I get it. I and I got it this evening when um, they got off to that terrific start. And I think it was on comms at the time, and I said, look, the, the game begins when when the slow bowlers come on, and the, the, you know Pakistan's stats against spin have, have compared very unfavorable unfavorably with England's in the, uh, in the same sort of period. And I, I was very interested to see what they did when that happened. Um, and lo and behold, what they did was that they looked for ones. You know, they, they kind of we're going to paddle sweep, we're going to knock it into into a gap, and maybe try and make two. And the and the the difference between that and the way that they went after the new ball was quite stark. Now, having got off to such a terrific start, and again, I'm not blaming them for for Pakistan's low score. But what I'm saying is, is that having got off to to, to, to that terrific start, if you'd put England in a similar position, those guys would have gone up, would have not allowed Adil Rashid and Rowan Ali to settle. They'd have just kept ham kept hammering at them, and they might have lost a wicket or two, but they would have just kept going at them and. and kept hammering home the advantage that they gained in the in the early part. But what Pakistan did was they kind of invited invited Moeen and, and Rash into the game by saying, we're not going to try and hurt you. We're not going to hit you. Then they get out. Then the new batters come in who have not been performing particularly well. And the whole thing just hits a brick wall. So I can kind of, I understand the criticism from both sides because I think, you know, if they don't trust the guys coming in behind them, then it's difficult for them to go hell for leather. But then if they don't, if they don't sort of keep going in terms of building that momentum and they allow the opposition back into the game, then they're asking for trouble themselves as well. So very, very difficult. What they need, what they need to find is they need to find a couple of the, you know, guys like the South Africans have your, 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 your Stubbses and your, um, your Brevises and the, the guys for Australia that can come in and just monster the game at the back end in the last six or seven overs. Pakistan don't have that. They're not scary at the end of a, of a batting innings in the way that, that a lot of teams are. Um, and that gives bowling attacks encouragement. And it also means that the batting lineup against you doesn't have as many to chase on the you know, second time round. And, and th there is an issue for them. And the Wazim and Wacker kind of, a, a, you know, nobody seems to be able to agree on what the problem is. I think that the elephant in the room is that they do not have a couple of guys who are terrifyingly muscular in terms of hitting. Um, that are going to turn 120 into 200 in the last five overs of a game. They don't have it. Um, and that causes a massive problem. It causes anxiety at the top, causes anxiety in the middle, and leaves your bowlers with too much to do too, too many times. And the bowlers aren't always going to be able to defend 150 for you. Mm. Well, cheers for your time, Butch. Uh, we'll see you next week after four or five more T20s. Jimbo asks, what are the pod's honest opinions on a seven-game T20i series? It feels far too long for me and lacks context, but so does most international cricket. It also feels like it will become more common in the future. Who wants to take that one on? Too long. I actually, I don't think it's too long. I mean, it, it, obviously it is too long and that seven is a big number, uh, but I kind of... There are bigger numbers. There are, yeah. Uh, loads, lo of loads, loads of big numbers. Yeah. Yeah. Plenty you, of smaller ones too. Oxford, mate. You should yeah. know that. Uh, but I actually... In a way, I prefer a seven-match series, say, to two, three-match T20 ODI series. Like, I find those are much, much more forgettable. That, like, uh, in those, you easily get, you know, one collapse and it's basically kind of all over. Whereas this, you can have a bad day and come back into it. Um, like, a, the one of the bilateral series I remember most clearly is a seven-match series between Australia and India in, like, 2013, 14, something, where George Bailey scored loads of runs. There were loads of runs. Altogether, I think it ended with uh, one of Rohit's double hundreds. Uh, and I think there is time for teams to sort of, you know, to players to lose form and gain form, for battles to start, for narratives to develop. And actually, I kind of prefer it to like to a few shorter series. Those are things like, that are really forgettable. That's a um, low bar, though. Would you say? That's a low bar. No, no, five, sure, five sure. Five would be all right, wouldn't it? Uh, yeah, yeah, five, five, five would also be fine, yeah. But but, but seven, I, I, I prefer seven to three, I think. You know, Hitler was and terrified of the number seven. Yeah? Yeah, he'd have hated this. Yeah. How many games in this series do you reckon you'll remember in two years' time? Uh, none. <laughs> uh, I think we're missing the point, though. 
It's 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 for the crowds, isn't it? It's for it's for the the, the the punters out in Pakistan. We haven't played there. England haven't played there in seventeen years. So oh, there, there are good reasons for it, and yeah. there are also reasons to play lots of warm-up games to give everyone a go before a World Cup. So there are good reasons for it. But if the question is, do we like seven match T Twenty series in general? Absolutely not. But there are mitigating circumstances. The, the, this time. the idea of a sort of slowly revealing narrative. Um, is all very well until you do get to the end of that narrative and then you go, all oh, right, okie dokie, let's just do another thing then. Let's just yeah. do something else then happens after that. There, there, there's, there's not going to be, from you know, if you are asking the question, there's not going to be much build up of tension because there's not much tension in the first place. But then I think maybe that's not the, the grounds upon which this thing exists anyway, you know? This series could have a narrative of sorts in that it's leading up to a World Cup. You've got the Alex Hale story, which is obviously the, the big one from yesterday. If England end up going on to win a World Cup and Alex Hales plays a significant part in it, this this is the series that got him back into that slot because you'd have said at the start of this series, Butler and Salt are probably the openers already. I think that's probably switched. I think if you started the, the World Cup tomorrow, Hales has to play. So, you know, there are there are subplots that exist that wouldn't exist if it wasn't for a World Cup. So. Yeah, I think, that's, I think that's a good shout. I think it's a very good shout. Um, probably Butch would have already spoken about this. Um, but I, I enjoyed Mark... Mark Wood. I enjoyed Luke Wood yesterday very much. Um, he's one of these kind of cricketers that come from the, the, the edges a bit of, of county cricket. Not a player that you particularly notice. He seems like he's put on about three yards of pace in the last two or three years. Uh, and, you know, he's a sparky sort of cricketer and the sort of cricketer that, you, you know, quite easy to get behind. Um, he bowled really, really well. And obviously the Hale story has a sort of, sort of Hollywoody quality to it. Um, and there's that kind of awkward redemption arc element going on. And also the kind of interesting fact that him and Stokes have to then share dressing rooms for the next few weeks, months. Uh, but yeah, the, the Luke, the Luke Wood story kind of feels, feels like a nice one as well, you know, and, and I was really pleased to see Gleason get a go as well. And he bowled quick, you know, the last time we saw him was the hundred final. Um, where it fell apart for him on, in, at the death, but I thought it was quite an impressive performance, and I did enjoy it. I, I did enjoy it, and you know, I was engaged with it. Um, I say I was engaged with it. I was engaged with it up to the first six overs of England's England's chase, and then I sort of went to the gym and forgot it was on, and so I only checked the result when I got in, which I guess is telling in itself. But I liked. Uh, they, I thought they were really good in the field. Adil Rashid as well, having the time of his life. The, the interview that he gave might have even been with Butch. I can't remember, but. No, I think it was with the host broadcaster, but he gave a lovely interview at halftime, you know, and there is that beautiful element to it. Moeen says it was meant to be that he leads them back into, you know, the, the his family's origin story is, is playing out here and, and obviously with, with Adil as well. So there was a lot, lot of things to like about that game of cricket, for sure. And, and Wood's performance uh, is potentially quite significant as well with, with Wood, sorry, Mark Wood and Wokes in that squad but not having played for so long there's a good chance that one or both of them won't be able to see the tournament through or maybe can't even start it so if England's fringe seamers can can bowl like he did yesterday that's that's huge because that's that's been their weakness for a, for a while uh, and continues to be that way so yeah he's, he's potentially got quite a big chance over the next few weeks and also with the four lefties in the squad, it's quite easy to compare them as well. And he's more versatile than than certainly David Willey. And that showed the ball wasn't really swinging at all yesterday. So David Willey stopped trying to pitch it up and trying to swing it early. And then like, what 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 does he have to offer to really threaten yeah. someone like Baba and Rizwan? Um, moving on, Joe, what is your moment of the week? My moment of the week was Kent winning the Royal London Cup. First one day cup trophy since 1978. Uh, and it was a good occasion. Uh, they made the massive mistake of not putting the final on uh, a weekend last last year, which thankfully they rectified. Uh, I wasn't there myself, but spoke to Taha Hashim. Remember him? I yeah. do, yeah. Uh, he was there, said it was a good atmosphere. I think there's about 9,000 in the ground. Uh, said actually, during, particularly during the chase, that it, it, it felt like a good atmosphere. It felt like a cup final. And got a decent game. Ken were relatively comfortable uh, in the end, obviously, the, it was the Darren Stevens send-off was the was the big narrative of the day. Uh, I wrote in my interview, at the end of my interview with him, that he wouldn't go quietly. He actually kind of did. I mean, it, it, a bit of a scratchy 30 and, and then went off after injuring himself while bowling. Uh, the story of the day was Joey Everson, who 
He's technically still a Knotts player on loan at Kent at the moment. He's joining them permanently at the end of the season. Uh, scored 97, took a couple of wickets, including the Yorker to finish the game. When I spoke to Stevens a couple of weeks ago, he said Emerson reminded him a bit of Shane Watson. And, and, and you can see that. He's a big bloke, plants on the front foot, just hits through the line of the ball. And Emerson wasn't, meant, wasn't signed as an opener. They just had a bit of a, an injury crisis, availability crisis. And uh, he stepped in, scored 100 in a group game and, and looks really well suited to that role in, in 50 over cricket. But another interesting aspect of it was that Kent didn't go back and pick their 100 players. So you've got a lot of them, Crawley, Billings, Beldrummond, Milnes, Leaning, all of which weren't selected because they wanted to stick with the guys who'd got them to the final, which was admirable, but quite brave given the way that the rest of Kent season has gone. They're struggling in the championship, a good chance they might go down absolute stinker of a defence of their blast trophy where they came bottom of the South group. So there was quite a lot riding on this despite the fact that we know the 50 over cup isn't held in the same regard as it used to be. Uh, so brave call from Kent and it, it paid off handsomely. Um, mm. And yeah, it might not be the the big trophy that everyone wants to win, but it is still a trophy and a lot of fans care a lot about Until it. Until two trophies in two years when it hasn't actually gone that well for them in, in quite a significant part of their operation. Yeah. Yeah, and like I said, the, the, we've got to be a bit careful about what we talk about the current round of championship games because wickets are falling so, so <laughs> fast. I think change, games can change quite quickly. But that game with Hans is in the balance on what looks like a pretty terrible pitch. Um, and then they've got to play Somerset in their final game, which could be a, a winner-takes-all, uh, as in winner, winner stays up, loser goes down. Hmm. Poor, poor Jack Leaning, who uh, when he was in the 100 was sort of the poster boy for the, if he's not playing in the 100, let him play in the one-day cup. <laughs> Uh, so I made a game 100 and then he hit the 100 pinches and kept like, actually, uh, we'll stick to our one-day cut players. That would be harsh, didn't it? Yeah. I thought mm. that as well, yeah. Ben, we were saying the other day that Joey Everson's a kind of classic Kent signing, someone who's done really, really well in the twos. And he's only 20, but um, he has been talked about for quite a long time when he's at Knotts, really highly regarded when he was as young as 17, 18, just wasn't able to get into that Knotts side. Lyndon James was kind of blocking that path for the all-rounder spot. Yeah, so we did a thing in WCM three years ago, I think. Uh, on the best teenagers in the UK and he was part of that and his name came up a lot he was I think already playing England under 19 two yeah. years two years young or at least one year young uh, and he was being talked about as a, a genuine all-rounder then his batting at the moment looks quite a bit better than his bowling I think he's going to be a batting all-rounder um, but he is a big bloke he could you could see him getting an extra couple of yards of pace but you can absolutely it was a, a surprise move Knots were really upset to lose him but he, I think he's he's made the right call here. You've got to play at this age. He hasn't played enough games so far in his career. Mm. And also Kent obviously will need an all-rounder from next season. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, he'll, he'll play all formats and be a key player for them. Um, ben, there's a weird five-run penalty against Kent. Do you want to talk us through that one? Yeah. Uh, well, I, th I thought what I found the weirdest was how puzzled people were by it, saying they'd never seen it before. And it happened only a few months ago. If people have been remembered the, the Pakistan West Indies ODIs, uh, Babar Azam did it. Uh, he, so what happened was... Uh, Ollie Robinson, the Kent keeper, went to field the ball, so he ripped off his gloves so he could throw it at the stumps. Uh, Harry Finch was just having a bit of fun, put one of the gloves on to catch the ball, uh, which you're not allowed to do. Obviously, only the wicket's allowed to wear gloves, so uh, Kent were hit with a with a five-run penalty. But Babra Zaman done the exact same thing in, a, in an ODI against the against West Indies a few months ago. I have to confess, um, I missed that at the time. Yeah, no, but... Uh, <laughs> Uh, I mean, oh, yeah, I, I, here, I, really. I was all over. I was, I was salivating. Yeah. Um, but yeah, uh, some some esteemed pundits were absolutely baffled by it, and uh, <laughs> and just seemed you like were feeling it. very superior. At yeah, that exactly, point, exactly. You? Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Phil, what was your moment of the week? Uh, well, I went to Amsterdam for a few days. Um, That's not what you said in your email to me yesterday. <laughs> um, uh, but I did get back for the first day back um, after that strange weekend, and. Uh, saw Ollie Pope crown his summer, if you like. Um, that was some not, wasn't it? Funky Ollie name. Pope, man. He's, he's joyous to watch. And he's, he's in that beautiful, sweet spot of not having to prove anything to anybody, at least for this period of time. And it will change and it will wax and wane again, of course, as form and its vagaries play out. But for the moment, he feels as good as he possibly can, good as he's ever felt in his professional career. Uh, all of that said, this wasn't. This is a very important game of cricket. You know, Surrey, Surrey here at home against Yorkshire, albeit this is a, a kind of a slightly, this is a, an experimental Yorkshire side or, or a, a nascent transitional Yorkshire side, I'd say. Uh, 
That said, you know, they were two down relatively quickly, Surrey, having been inserted on the first morning with a bit of green green on the track and so on. And he just came out, literally first ball, he walked down the track, um, which is now his want, it's now his style. Walked right down the track, didn't get that one away, but he was off and running very quickly and it was a runner ball 50, no, 46 ball 50, I think it was, runner ball 100 and 131 ball 136. Uh, the way he brought it up, People would have probably seen it on on the Twitters and so on, but he he, he kind of jackrabbited back and managed to angle an uppercut over third man for six, uh, and then in the next over, reverse swept in his own interesting way when he kind of turns the body round that he faces faces with the right side of the body rather than the left side of the body, and he plays both sweeps on both sides of the pit, of, of, of the wicket with that particular style. And he, you know, he crunched a reverse sweep off Don Best to bring up his hundred. And, and I think and that was the first ball of spin bowl. It was, as well. yeah, it was. It was the first ball that he'd faced for sure, maybe of the whole day. And it was, um, it was a boy who now has a murmur of swagger about him. I think um, he's obviously the, you know, the, the 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 crown prince of the Oval, as we know. Uh, but he's now stitching those experiences with England onto his work with Surrey and it's coalescing. And now you're seeing this player who who knows he's the best young kid around and knows that he's beginning to to answer that calling. Um, and it was it was just majestic, really. No one else got past 40 odd. They've lost a couple actually early. No, one early on this morning. For, for so Ben Mike, Phil. Sorry, he's got his wicket. Ben Mike's got, ben his Mike's wicket. got a wicket. Stop all the clocks. Ben Mike has got a wicket. Ben Mike's one of these interesting cricketers. Um, I saw him for the first time live yesterday and he's got a very nice, smooth, languid action, liquid sort of style through the crease. This is a new signing for, for, for Yorkshire. Sorry, yeah, Leicester. making his debut for Yorkshire. He's signed from Leicester. He's been highly spoken of from, by various people because you can see that he's an athlete and that he has a little bit of pace. Darren Goff spoken highly of him, bringing him in. The only snag is that he doesn't take any wickets. That's the only slight snag. He he he, he went off in a blaze of glory from Leicester, naught for 90, naught for 50, and naught for 110. That's how he left Grace Road. And then he had a real stinker of a day yesterday on day one against Surrey, naught for something or other. But he's just picked one up, according to Ben. He, did, he took quite a lot of wickets early in the season because we did a little thing on him for the magazine, but they ha it has rather dried up. His last professional wicket if you discount what's happened in the last five minutes, was um, July the 1st was his last professional wicket. Uh, that said, you know, he's a young quick, so these things happen at funny times and you never know. And he, and he gives it a whack as well. He's, he's, he does. He's, a, he's an, he's an all-rounder. That is true. But anyway, look, it, uh, you'll probably round it up, but what Pope did yesterday was, was a beacon in, a, in, a, in an otherwise pretty pretty wicket heavy heavy landscape certainly in the top division it, for a bit of balance you know Glamorgan made only lost three wickets in across the day and so on so it wasn't uh that the ball was dominating everywhere but in the big games in the Hampshire game as you say and in the Essex game against Lancashire where 26 wickets mm -hmm. fell <laughs> I think they might be expecting a knock on the door at Chelmsford um yeah it, across that landscape, Pope's innings was an absolute beacon. It's just a, a stunningly good knock. Yeah, and I think people are quite quick to almost write off Pope's performances at the Oval. But as we've said before on the show this summer, that the Oval hasn't actually played like we expect the Oval to throughout the rest of the summer. And yesterday, the pitch did quite a lot. And um, his his approach, you could, yeah, he totally dominated the bowlers. He looked come. They played one ridiculous shot coming down the wicket. To hit, um, the one through the covers? No, it was actually over, over the leg side. That was the ball after the one through the covers. Yeah. So he did two in a row. And it's, yeah. again, talking about that swagger thing. Yeah, he ran and opened his shoulders through the covers. And then, as you say, next ball did the same. And from a good length ball, just just mullered it through straight mid-wicket. Just, just to add, his 100 yesterday moved an excitable Ben Gardner to tip him for 100 first-class 100s. Yeah, I did hear he's that. On, what, he's on 15? He's on 15 Yeah, yeah but I, I kind of just thought if, if anyone is going to, it's... Pope, if his career goes a certain way, basically, if he doesn't end up breaking into England's white ball side, which is a possibility, I think. I mean, it's possible that he does end up playing lots of white ball cricket. But if he doesn't, he's, he's going to play lots of county cricket and lots of test cricket and is already going at sort of like five or six hundreds a summer for Surrey anyway. 
so that and if, so if, if he then goes on a long time I'm not saying any of these things are likely but of any player if anyone was going to do it I'd say that Ollie Pope is kind of the only one I can see feasibly basically he'll play more white ball cricket though won't he I think that's the yeah, aside po- from that's po- a very challenging po- thing possibly to do. but but cr- he, I but, think he's too good not to but but cricket's careers at the, this moment in time get pigeonholed in like in either way don't you if you start going on the franchise circuit all of a sudden you find you're not playing any county cricket or county championship cricket and then you're not in that test conversation from the other point of view a franchise is going to look at this guy who's not played barely any white ball cricket and think this is a guy we're going to take a punt on or they're going to guy that they know has a proven track record in this competition this competition this competition like you just find your opportunities are limited almost by circumstance more than by choice and that could happen and it'll be that he might get a small window of a competition where he's like this is the one I get to make my name in. and if he doesn't then all of a sudden you've got Ollie Pope 26 played loads of first class cricket not got that much white record to speak of and he's a first class specialist and that is sometimes how these things happen I think yeah I mean I could see he seems the natural success of a route at three in the 50 totally. over side totally uh, how much 50 over cricket is actually played is, yeah. is, an, is another question and then from there you feel like he'll look so good that he'll play, play T20 cricket. No, I, You're right. I think the franchise stuff is going to take longer to come around than it should do because he's good at other stuff. I, I, I think he should be, he's a, he's a very good candidate for, yeah, number three, number four in that England ODI side right now. And the fact that how well he can construct an innings on Flash's pitches speaks to it. I mean, that was like a, a one day innings yesterday, basically, but like a proper one day innings that would be right in that England ODI mould. So I, I think he would do a very good job. It's whether England sort of, see that as well and they have all these depth charts and stuff and I don't know where the Pope sits on that in white ball cricket it's tough to know mm. um, um, to be honest what we plan to talk about in the championship has changed quite a lot since yesterday afternoon um, as Phil mentioned 49 wickets fell at Chelmsford and the Aegeus Bowl, Aegeus Bowl combined um, Kent were bowled out against title contenders Hampshire for 167 who themselves were dismissed for 57 and then they had Kent 20 for 3 at the close 26 wickets fell at Chelmsford. Lancashire were five for five at one point in their second innings on day one. Um, ben, Lancashire head coach Glenn Chapel was not very happy. Yeah, five for five and then seven for six as well, I think. Uh, um, yeah, he, he he was very, very critical of, of the pitch and especially for how it played under lights. I think uh, he said that they turned up the day before and thought this pitch doesn't look great, maybe it'll play okay, but there were footholds there. So we know we've got to bat first because it's only going to get worse. And actually it was playing pretty tough from to begin with he said that uh there was for the first three quarters day there was a ball with your name on it and that could just happen and then for the last 30 minutes you described it's just ridiculous um so that's obviously not great Lancs have just seen have lost another one so they're now 34 for seven that game could very easily been over on uh on that evening i think i mean when they were seven for six and if the spinners had been forced to be brought on to bowl at that point they easily could have lost the, the next four for uh for not very many and then essex are chasing 40 odd uh under the lights, uh, which Shane Snater been... five for six, yeah, as big as which it is stands. which is which is decent. So yeah, I mean that that's that's not great, and uh, and, and the the Hampshire game also obviously not great. I, I guess it's tough. It's interesting to try and figure out because when ECB did this um, this bit of research about when was good for playing cricket in the season, they kind of came to the conclusion based on it that everyone was basically the same. But actually, in September there was a wasn't a huge dip, but it was a dip of sort of four or so runs in the batting averages to earlier in the season. And I think how that happens isn't that every pitch and every ground in the country becomes like a little bit hard for batting. It's that you get some outlier pitches, basically, which I guess is probably what we've got at Chelmsford and at the Aegeus Bowl. And so you get some places which remain good for batting and you get some good service and you get some where, you know, because it's maybe the, the weather's a bit more variable, it comes that much harder to predict as a, as a groundsman. All the pitches are, are wearing a bit running because of how much cricket has been played. That That's when you get the surfaces that do enable these like borderline farcical matches to take place and i Mm. guess that's what's happened in a couple of places here i mean hampshire were livid after losing at chelmsford what month was that was that august or july it was early june oh right okay (laughs) fine ages ago sorry it was late june late june late june uh should add that essex didn't have any points deducted at that point so the pitch was considered reasonable seemingly uh, I, mean, I mean Hampshire were chasing 299 and they got to 286 on the fourth inning so I think you know that's that's an okay cricket pitch yeah but I mean you obviously spend a lot of time around Essex what do you think has, has happened here because there is Essex, I, I really, Essex, Essex aren't going for the title here right this is a third place playoff effectively between it's, these two it's an interesting they one. just want three days off or is it has but has do you think it's an interesting one this are uh, they doctoring a pitch or are they I don't is it just too hard to control at this stage I know that they've not been 
especially happy with the pitch and the consistency of the pitch for a few years. They being the players? or They, be, they being the players, the, the senior players and the management. Uh, the first three games at Chelmsford in the early part of the summer were, th- were three draws with only one of them with any rain affected. First game was 500, plays 500. Second game was 390, plays plays 330. Essex hung on for a draw against North Ends. The next game was 400, plays 400. And they were really frustrated with those pitches because nothing was happening. Now, this is so-called Fortress Essex. This is where they have this unbeatable, you know, seam attack and spinner and all the rest of it. And the, the perception is they scramble home, you know, on these kinds of, very juicy, very, very lively tracks. Uh, but if that was the case consistently, then you wouldn't have had those three games. I was at that first game in, in particular against Kent and it was agony to watch. Uh, and nothing happened and, and a ball didn't move off the straight the whole time. So so if there was any design on those pitches to force a result, then clearly it hasn't happened. As for what's happening in this particular game, there is no logical reason why they would actively want to uh, demean the contest by creating deliberately a shit heap. There's no logical reason why. You could say cynically if they were desperate to be getting to, to be going for the title, but you're only really talking about whether they'll finish third or fourth here. They're playing lengths, so there is a tiny bit of jeopardy on it, but there's not that much really. Uh, and I'd say the same with Hampshire. Right. Hamp- Hampshire against Kent. Kent. Uh, Struggling this season, right. not only struggling, but they're missing a, a few regular players. You think if Hampshire and Kent played each other on a flat one, Hampshire would be massive. I, I, I guess the concern is you have to force a result. If there's any kind of weather around, and if you prepare a so called flattish proper cricket track, then you, I guess you possibly run the risk of not bowling well in the first session and then. They've racked up three fifty four hundred, and then it's harder to force the result. I guess that might be the thinking, but again, I think there's a lot of unplanned variability in all of this. And this is that's the crux of what I was trying to get at because yeah. it, there is the automatic assumption that something is un- underhand is happening here, and I just wonder at this time of the year whether actually groundsmen just might get it wrong because so, the, the the margin for error is that much smaller. Because yeah. the, the only thing with where Hampshire are concerned is is bonus points as well. Like even if they do in that game, which they they well might, they're going to sort of lose another. Probably three points looking at how Sari going this morning to Sari on the on, on the batting front. And that's going to leave them, what, 11 behind going to the last game, which is a if, if they back themselves, right, yeah. they're going to score 400 quickly and then we're going to bowl Kent out twice. Then actually they've they gained ground and now they're they're likely to to lose a bit, which actually means that Sari will probably be able to get away with a, with a high scoring draw next week rather than a, rather than needing to win it, I think. And hmm. um, just another thing on on the oval here, that test match last week, last or a week and a bit ago, lasted what? Two and a half, two and a bit days. Lords lasted two days and a bit. I think Old Trafford third test managed to creep into a fourth day, possibly. I can't really remember. But my point is, no one is designing those cricket pitches for landmark marquee test matches with all of the commerce and all of the the possibility to to get the, the you know the, the, the tillers kachinging. No one's looking for a two and a half day test match at the best of times. Um, but as we've asked. As, and as Surrey have asked for a bit more life and a bit more spice in their tracks, and we've been lauding the oval tracks all along, was that track a bad track because that test match was over in two and a bit days? No, it wasn't. It was a challenging track, and the ball moved more than you'd expect to see. But again, if you're a good player, you find a way around that. And one con- slight concern that I have with this obsession with crap pitches, bad conditions, is that it's too easily used as an excuse, I think, um, that pitch yesterday at Essex could have been an absolute shocker. I don't know. I didn't see any of it. I wasn't watching it yesterday. Um, and I, I'm not seeking to, you know, back them up here. But if you if you end up six for six, that's not automatically just because the pitch is a disaster. That, that in itself is, is, is negligible batting, isn't it? That that in it, in itself, you can be playing on the worst track ever. But if you've got an hour to bat and you've got two good openers, then you then you have to try and find a way to negotiate these things. A lot a lot of the time, you find pitches around the world in Test match cricket that are crap. You know, bad for cricket in inverted commas. But you've got to try and find a way through it. 
And that would be my one concern. I think batters at the end, of, especially at the end of a season when they've gone through the, the full gamut of emotions, they get to the end of it and think, oh, well, you know, I'll hang my bat out there and hopefully it'll work out. And if it doesn't, then we can just shrug our shoulders and blame the pitch anyway. Hmm. Every time this comes up, someone will ask a question about, well, Somerset got the point a couple of years ago. Why isn't the same happening to Essex or Hampshire in this case? But what it's worth, I think Essex probably will, will get hit. I yeah. mean, they've had a couple of, two or three low scorers there. There's been murmurs around it. There's also a kind of PR element, I think, from the ECB pitch inspection team. If they don't penalise a track that gives up 26 mm. weeks in a day, then then you, people will rightly say, I suppose, what's going on? Yeah, I guess but with Somerset in 2019, they didn't get docked for excessive turn. They got they got docked for inconsistent bounce. And I was there for that game and it was inconsistent. It, that's and not that's what you what, expect. That was Chappell's complaint about mm. the pitch yesterday. Yeah. Mm. Um, Elsewhere, Dom Sibley scored a vital 100 for Warwickshire yesterday in their game against Gloucestershire. Uh, Warwickshire just about held on to uh, avoid defeat against Somerset last week. Um, the Bears were 138-6 for six at one point yesterday. Um, so hugely important innings for Sibley. And they've got to play Hampshire in their final game. Mm. So they're, they're really up against it, Warwickshire. And then on Somerset, who nearly got that win against Warwickshire last week, Sam Hain. Uh, well, sorry, for Warwick, Joe, Sam Haynes scored runs in both innings. <coughs> Somerset are still in danger, Joe, but Tom Abel is doing a really good job at keeping them up at the moment. Yeah, I mean, they'd be sunk without him, really. He scored his fourth Championship 100 of the season yesterday. Um, we saw him score 150 not out, a career best innings at, against Surrey in April. Notch two in between in the one yesterday. He's, he just looks, he's 28 now. He looks like a kind of player who's really coming of age, which is an odd thing to say, given that he was named captain at such a young age. But I think as as Ben, I think you said in the podcast before, that might have held his batting back a little bit. Now it looks like he's able to marry it all together. And he's just a really impressive cricketer. I know when Butch was asked to pick out a couple of young batters, probably maybe this time last year, maybe a little bit longer ago, he, he said Harry Brook and Abel were the two that he thought would go on and play for England in some formats or all formats. And I think Abel is, is pushing in that direction now. The thing is, there isn't really a spot for him, mm. um, but I think he'll be in a squad sooner rather than later. Um, yeah, he's, he's an impressive player. And I think, I think that probably will be okay this year because of him. I think they'll get the points they need. Um, but yeah, 400s, no one else has scored. No, no one's scored more than that in Division 1 this year. So it's a, And he's never managed more than two in a season before. But he's kind of been... Lots of gritty 50s, important knocks, but not getting to three figures. And we know how important that is when it comes down to England selection, those standout knocks. And he's he's played a few of them this year. He has here as well. I think, I, I know it's kind of oval-centric, this, this podcast a bit, but that's how it is. We work here. Um, the runs he made here in the early season was absolutely brilliant. I think, it, was it double? Was it? That was 150. That's right, yeah. Uh, he was unlucky in the second innings. I think he might have been caught down the leg side. Uh, but that one for 50 on the first innings um, on day one was absolutely brilliant. He's technically very good to watch, I think. Um, yeah, very good, very good cricket. Um, elsewhere, Essex beat Yorkshire by one wicket last week. Uh, Matt Potts took 13 in the matches. Durham beat Leicester and Middlesex beat Glamorgan to put them in pole position to go up alongside Knotts. Rich asks, are the short-term loans fair in county cricket? Hampshire loaned Wheel to Gloucestershire for one game early in the year that happened to be against Surrey. Now, Surrey have loaned Conor McCurr to Kent, who are playing Hampshire right now. Are they trying to improve teams who are playing against their rivals? Uh, who wants to tackle that one? I think it's a really good question, and I think they do need to tighten up the rules. We, I think, I mean, we were talking about the, the pod before. I'm not really aware of this. They were saying that there may be rules in place that aren't being enforced. That there's a length of time alone should have yeah, to... Yeah, I haven't looked into this it's an area of regulations I'm actually not fully uh, on board with. But um, uh, yeah, but, but there, there, there are rules in place that should stop this kind of thing over that, yeah, loans, even short-term loans are supposed to be for a, a minimum amount of time. Uh, and that if a player has played a certain amount early in the season, they're not supposed to be able to allow to go on loan. And it's difficult to see in some of these cases how um, how those rules are being followed i suppose but haven't asked the relevant people for information so it might be that there are certain loopholes that there are, there are ways that exceptions can be granted but yeah it's not it's a uh, uh, I, I, I also don't know 
how I feel about it. On some level, it, it tells me that people, obviously people really care about winning the county championship, but it, it makes it feel like I like a bit of skullduggery sometimes in sport. Equally, it's obviously uh, a bit of a strange one to say. To I'm yeah. not sure I'd use the word equally personally. I yes. Think, I think it's a stinker. It's an absolute stinker. You know, it, it clearly demeans the integrity of the competition if you're, if you're planting one of your non-playing staff players into a fixture that, that you could do with, with them playing well in. You know, clearly that's, that's, not, that's not right. There is an issue regarding the number of cricketers who are not playing enough cricket, sure. And that the loan system's in place for good reasons. Uh, but it's hard for the bosses to look you in the eye and tell you that this is pure coincidence that Colin McCurr, one of the quickest through the air bowlers around, uh, is now playing for the team against their their title chasing rivals. Mm. You know, I mean, the, the, the thinking is pretty obvious there. And as, and as a one off game, for me, I, I'm not comfortable with that mm. personally. McCurr didn't actually even come on to bowl as, as Kent bowled Hampshire out for 57. Um, it wasn't required. But I think, yeah, a minimum number of matches that you have to be available for. Mm. And if you wanted to be stricter, and I'm not saying I would necessarily advocate for this, uh, no loans within the same division would be another way of looking at it. Particularly if mm. we end up with three divisions, that might that might be something you can look at. But there is that balancing act, as Phil says, of there's a lot of cricketers out there who need some games, and particularly when it comes to young players, you just want them playing. But And also how many fringe Division 2 players are going to get a gig in Division 1, I suppose. That's going to really leave those. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Maybe, that's, maybe that's not workable, but it certainly needs to be tightened up. It's, it seems to be honest, it's obviously a relatively new phenomenon. Uh, it feels like, I don't know if this, this statistically stacks up, but it feels like there are a lot of players moving around this year more than yeah. ever before. I thought that. There's the new thing where a player's out of contract, they sign for a new county. So Everson going from Notts to Kent, for instance, or Ryan Higgins from Gloucester to Middlesex. And then both counties agree that actually there's no point in them staying at that county for the rest of the season. They just go there early, which, you know, makes sense in a lot of ways as well. But it those deals can actually have quite a significant impact on who wins titles. And I don't, it just doesn't feel quite right. It feels like it needs to be a bit, a bit tighter. Mm. Can I just add, as just to round up the county stuff, for all the fun of the fair, for all the intrigue uh, and the who's, who's going up and who's, heading down and so on. There is a slight oddness to all of this because later today, the final report of Strauss's high performance review gets released to the press. Strauss is doing essentially a press conference round table interview with, with, with the media later on today. And as we know, within that, the recommendations of the draft report have strongly advocated for a reduction in four day, get four day cricket from 2024 but it could yet be brought forward if it is ratified and signed off by the counties. Um, in which case, we don't even know if it matters if, if this were to play out. And Notts going to not go up well, again. That, yeah, yeah. That, the most ludicrous situation where Notts are still not in the top division because they were quite bad in 2019. Right, yeah. <laughs> uh, and so if, if we do get to a point where it's broken up into three divisions, as looks likely, mm. I think, Mm. Uh, then I hate to say it, but much of this is kind of null and void. Obviously, whoever wins the championship will have that that yeah. gong, and whoever wins the second division will have the joy of being the best of the rest. It seems unlikely they'll turn that round quick enough for next year, though, right? Because they've committed to not reducing the number of championship games next year. Yes, so I indeed. don't think they would be able to. Yeah, most as, as I said, most likely it's twenty twenty four that they bring this in. But even with that, there is a slightly odd feeling of anti-climax mm. around all this stuff intriguing and, and gripping though, though though it is to to nerds like us mm, absolutely uh moving on to another tournament for us to nerd out on the t20 world cup hey hey woman ask who is your outsider bet for the t20 world cup so everyone bar scotland has named their squads for the t20 world cup uh some of the squads have been out for a while but the most eye-catching stories um are probably that tim david has been picked for australia Trent Bolt and Jimmy Nishan are both in the New Zealand squad despite not accepting central contracts. Shah Massoud is in the Pakistan squad. There's no Fakir Zaman. He's injured. And then with West Indies, Ben, there's no Andre Russell and no Sunil Narain. But there is Yannick Karaya, a 30-year-old leg spinner who has only ever played four domestic T20 games and hasn't played in the CPL for six years. How is he in the squad? Yeah, Why well, is he in the squad? The last season he games was in 2016 as well, I think. Mm. Uh, so he's played, he has played for West Indies, played three ODIs against uh, New Zealand earlier this year. Um, and they clearly just, like they see, he's played some A games as well. That's what Desmond Haynes uh, sort of 
picked out as having um, uh, bolstered his case. I guess there is a little bit of mystery about him. Like, I think he's got a slightly unusual Well, if he hasn't played action. since 2016, well, <laughs> it's going to be. <laughs> well, one of us would be the ultimate mystery pick, wouldn't they? Uh, but yeah, I mean, it's, 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 a, it's a really, really odd one and it's fascinating to see how he's going to how he's going to get on I guess because it is it's like none of us have seen him play and for once that's not just because we're on holiday in Amsterdam or wherever it's uh <laughs> it's because of them there standard mate it's just wore off a duck's back these days um but I, I found the whole West Indies squad announcement quite well strange to follow so so Sunil Narayan obviously one of the best 20 players in the world this is how Desmond Haynes explained him not being picked he said I didn't get any notes from Narayan regarding his availability to play there were conversations that the captain was having with Narine, and from all reports, it seems he was not interested. Uh, the captain told me he's reached out to Narine, and I'm not too sure he wants to play. It's like, this is one of the best T20 bowlers in the world. Just, just pick up the phone Desi, yourself. Pick Desmond, up the just, phone, just, man. Honestly. Just, just make sure. Like, he's like, no, actually, I, I'm actually really keen to play. It's like, oh, that's great. We'll, we'll get you in. We won't pick the, the 30 year old who even I haven't heard of, sort of thing. Uh, so, yeah, that's a. Uh, that is poor. Story I didn't know that. When yeah. you feel like West Indies cricket is sort of taking some steps to just make a bit more sense administratively, and then you hear that, it's like, how how has that been allowed to happen? And the Andre Russell uh, omission seems odd as well, and that he specifically said it's because of his lack of form, mm. right? Yeah. Which, mm. from the article I read, his form seems pretty good, and also we know that he's that a very good player. He has quite a high <laughs> high part, yeah. Yeah. He, uh, yeah, he had a poor CPL, but also smashed loads of runs in the 60 just before it. So, um, yeah, that is... Yeah, as, yeah, the the Haynes quote on that is uh, we're still not convinced yet. He's not performing as well as we would like to see him in the competition. Uh, we just decided to move on and look for someone who's in form and doing well in the T20 format. So there you go. They, they, so you they, bit they the guy who hasn't played in it for <laughs> six years, yeah. honestly. Of course, they may still turn up and, and go well, but this is quite dispiriting, isn't it? On the surface, because this is where their identity increasingly lies. This and is I the reason why the other stuff piece. doesn't work, right? Yeah, and <laughs> yeah, exactly. We've made our peace with it. This is this is what West Indies cricket looks like now, and the world changes, and we move with it, and so on and so on. But if it's been garbled as much as it sounds like it has been, then you do wonder wh- where it's going to end up. Mm. You know, if they turn up there and and have a poor tournament, as indeed they did last time round. They have two two back to back bad tournaments, um, then another little another little chip on the side of, of of this great edifice that is West Indies cricket takes place. And yeah, look, I hope that they have found a couple that we've never heard of that turn up yeah. there and, and and deliver. And they've obviously got some quality in there as well. They've got some young some young quicks that are well worth watching. But yeah, you do wonder. You do wonder. I, I can see them doing okay. Um, well, I hope I hope they do. They did well. They, they did they well do. against England early in the year in the Caribbean, and part of what went wrong in the World Cup last year was they had all these old guys who are still living off their 2016 form, basically, who weren't as good as they were six, seven years ago. Um, did we pick our outside bets? We didn't really do that, did we? Not yet. Do you oh, want still to come? Do you, do, you want, do you want to do it now? I thought we were about to move on. Sorry, you, um, you know, you, you carry on. I was just going to say that uh, the South Africa squad was named a couple of They're weeks my ago. Bet. Okay. Um, their captain is Temba Bavuma, who the other day was not picked up in the auction for the new South African franchise T20 competition. And, you know, you've got um, upwards of 100 players selected for that competition and he wasn't one of them. Uh, I bumped into one of the Crickviz guys this morning who explained that it's not that each franchise thought that he's not in the top 60 South African players available. It's that they probably all overestimated how much he would go for. So none of them factored him into their squad planning. Um, but still, it's a bizarre situation to have uh, Temba Bavuma, the Safra captain for the T20 World Cup, and a squad that was announced two weeks ago, not in their franchise competition. Yeah, I mean, there's, I'm sure there's auction dynamics at play, and it's not as if you know anyone's saying that Temba Bavuma is a you know a, a rubbish cricketer or anything. But there is a a slight sore point and point of controversy within South African cricket that he holds that position within the T20 side in particular. I think in, in one day cricket, there's no question over his stature as someone who can sort of build an innings and bat through and lay a platform but in t20 cricket i mean he he does not score very quickly and that's something that in south africa have a lot of strength and depth and that they kind of got a bit of a uh they ha- they avoided an, uh, uh, a tough decision because razi van der is injured and is therefore out of the tournament and it was going to be him or or bavuma but it does it it doesn't it doesn't you know there is maybe a bit more nuance to it than you know Everyone thinks he's bad, apart from the people who pick the Safka team. And maybe you could also argue that 
if the Stafford team management see him as a very, very valuable captain, maybe that is more important as the uh, when you're in charge of a national team rather than when you're in charge of a, a franchise. I don't know. But it is also something that uh, will be worth following the World Cup, how his form actually goes and, and how long he continues as leader in the format after that, if it does go poorly, considering what the opinion lots of people have of him in the format, I guess. Mm. Um, and Joe, you said that Safka are your outside bets for the World Cup. Yeah, I was impressed with them uh, this summer against England. They've got a couple of really exciting young players coming through. Uh, Tristan Stubbs, obviously, is going to be really big in this format. Be exciting to see if he can do it in other formats he's, too. Sorry, is Brevis in the squad? No. no, no. So he, but obviously he's another one that will come through soon. But they've got, uh, they suddenly seem to have got quite a lot of depth in this format in a way that I don't remember them having for a little while. Uh, they've got, we've seen the pace attack. You know that that works in all formats. Um, you know I don't, I actually don't think they'll win it, but I think I have higher hopes for them this time than I have in more mm. recent. Um, World Cups and they and they were really close to getting to the knockouts last time as well. It was what net run rate that meant that they they so they tied with England at the top of the group, um, but it was net run rate that meant they didn't make the semi-finals. Yeah, so, did they go a bit slow and it, did they kind of ruin their own chances? I'm struggling to remember this last one. It wasn't even that long ago. Yeah, I, I'm, I, mean, I feel like they didn't go quick enough at a point where they could have done, which eventually and which was highlighted by England going really really quickly and they chased against Australia. I think yeah. so. There were a couple of other teams that really crushed it from that point of view, and they yeah. But, hmm. Uh, ben, what's your moment of the week? Uh, my moment of the week is uh, is from a T20I that um, almost passed me by. It was only a couple of days ago that I kind of realised the series was was going on, um, which is between Australia and India, uh, which was a it was a brilliant game. It was um, almost weird in itself, right? Like two of the biggest teams in the world just have a series and no one realises it's happening until the day before. Yeah, loads of weird stuff. I mean, it's in, in the UK. It's on at Sav Gold, which is increasingly becoming a major player in the uh, <laughs> in the English cricket. TV market for some reason they showed the Asia Cup and now showing this it's also sponsored by Mastercard not I think it's Paytm who normally uh who normally show it which is also just slightly jarring and the BCI put out a highlight clip on the social media which is something that they never do so loads of weird stuff going on uh but the game itself was um was a good one India did what they increasingly do now and got lots of runs very quickly without uh well there was one major contribution from uh from Hardik Pandya who hit three six of the last three balls to get a career best 70. Uh, Kara Hall made a half century, which is a bit of a return to four innings and made it quite quickly. Sky did his usual thing of, of scoring lots of runs, not doing very much. But the story really was, um, well, two stories, I suppose. The one that I found most interesting was, uh, was Matthew Wade, who has uh, quietly developed just an absolutely absurd record over the last 12 months in T20i cricket. So he's, he's only batting at six and seven now. He's purely a finisher. and uh, And since this time last year, uh, he's played 16 games. He's averaging 109 and striking at 160. Uh, he's he's had he's batted in four chases, been out in every single one, and Australia have won every single one, including the 41 off 17 or whatever it was, where he hit Shaheen for loads of six in the penultimate over to win uh, that semi-final last year. Um, and he's just a player you'd think was coming to the end of his career and suddenly found a new lease of life as this guy. He can go incredibly quickly, incredibly fast, incredibly consistently against the fast bowlers in t20 cricket and then the other story was uh was cameron green who it was was amazing the stature he already has the commentators were talking about him before the game uh as if he was already an ipl millionaire basically as if it was a foregone conclusion that he'll get picked up and then he goes and smashes 61 off 30 opening the batting so and that's the first time he's ever opened the batting in a professional t20 yeah I, i actually wonder i mean he might well go for lots of money because doing that kind of thing against india is something that will increase your value I'm, I'm actually not sure quite how valuable T20 player he is quite yet because I don't know how good his bowling is. I mean, he went for uh, over 15 and over yesterday. Uh, and I don't think even with that, you'd say this guy is one of the best T20 bats in the world that will justify a huge price tag. And if he's not that, then I don't know if his bowling is going to add the value to make him an overall valuable pick, if that makes sense. It might be that he gets loads of money as a sort mm. of uh, a bit building for the future pick, I guess, if we think that this guy's young and he's going to be the best T20 player in the world in four years' time, then you might get him now, I suppose. But mm. yeah. he's, also, he's not in Australia's World Cup squad either. Mm. Hasn't made it into that. So, mm. you know, he's some way off. Although it does seem odd that Steve Smith's there and he's not. Yeah. And also on, on performance against India, Carl Jameson became very rich very quickly for doing well in a test match against That's true. India. That's true. So I think doing well in a T20 will make uh, Cam Green extremely rich very, very quickly. Um, Shervo asks, 
Amy Jones is short of runs in this series. Is it just the curse of captaincy sudden, suddenly finding herself? Is it just the curse of suddenly finding herself a wicket keeping captain? And if so, with the likes of Alice Davidson Richards in really good form, wouldn't it make sense to put her lower down the order? England are one nil down in the ODI series against India. Um, ben, what do you think? I guess it's an interesting question with Lauren Winfin Hill doing really well um, at the moment. Ever since she was dropped for England, she's been brilliant. I think she's got. Um, four fifties in a century and six innings in the Rachel oh. Hayo Flint trophy. And that's someone who's kept wicket for England before. I'm not saying necessarily. She had a really good hundred as well. Yeah. Average so, 50, I think. And I'm not saying that England should drop Jones, but they do have another option there to bolster the, the middle order with, with regular players not playing at the moment. Yeah. I guess the, the Jones question is interesting because I don't think it's the captaincy thing as such. I mean, she's kind of flattered to deceive almost, almost throughout her international career. And if you look at her record against, I guess the two best sides, Australia and India, her record is, is poor. I mean, she's only scored above 30 uh, once against those two sides in 20 ODI innings. Um, but one thing is that she's a brilliant keeper. I think, I don't think people would argue that Lauren Bilderhull is a, a match for her just with the gloves. Um, and then also there are just the lack of other options. I think the only other active player to have kept for England is Tammy Beaumont. Um, and England no longer really see her as a wicketkeeping option. She didn't keep in, in the 100 um, and then you've got Lauren Winfield Hill, who's never kept for England, but did do it throughout that over Mintables campaign. Then you've got some some youngsters, the likes of uh, Ellie Threckle, and if they want to poach Sarah Bryce from Scotland, I guess it's her as well. But there aren't really those banging the door down apart from Lauren Winfield Hill. And she has had a, a brilliant summer. I mean, if you listened to the podcast a couple of weeks ago when I spoke to her, she talked about how after that uh, winter with England, when she was dropped, uh, she sort of said she had almost like a, like a complete... A, a breakdown basically that she that she was, was feeling off when she came back and she kind of had to almost reinvent herself not not as a cricketer but the way that she was viewing cricket in her life basically that she felt she was taking it much too seriously essentially that she wasn't able to actually enjoy even when she had days off and time off she was spending all her time thinking about uh playing cricket and especially it's, if she had like an evening match or an afternoon match she'd wake up in the morning she'd be thinking the whole day how am I going to play this? What am I going to do? And now she waits in the morning. She has she has plans. She goes and walks dog. She goes for a coffee. Uh, and then she just arrives at the game and then bats. And that is doing wonders for her. So because a lot of those things I was saying about Amy Jones, you could level at Long Winfield Hill over, the, uh, the, over her career. She's obviously also not got impressive numbers, but it might well be that she has kind of rediscovered herself. And if so, it might be that the value that she adds with the bat, uh, she that that could make up for what England might lose in the gloves. And the other point is that I think there is merit possibly to having a, a more of a specialist keeper in women's cricket in particular, because you do have, especially for England, who don't have as many sort of proper out and out quicks as other countries do. You can have, a, if you have a keeper, you can like stand up reliably to the stumps to almost all your seamers that will save a lot of runs and buy you some wickets as well. And that is something that is valuable and is worth looking into, especially when England do have quite a lot of all round options, I guess. Mm. Lean to that. My, my moment of the weekend is related to, um, players finding a new lease of life uh, when the opportunity might look like it's it's ending. is It's Cam's piece for Quick Info. I don't know if you guys have read it. It's basically about innings that saved someone's career. And he uh, he compares Mike Hussey and Ravi Bopara to the 2009 Ashes, both of whom were really, really struggling. Bopara's dropped off for the fourth test match. He then scores a double hundred uh, for Essex kind of as the fifth test happens, Hussey scores 100 and his career is saved and goes on. And it's really interesting. He talks to different people, including Nick Compton, who went through that experience a couple of times of what it's like to, it's what it's like to go out to bat for your country when you think your career might already be over and actually how freeing that can be. Um, I'd highly yeah, recommend Yeah, I, I did read it. He, he sent it to me actually when he was writing it and the stuff on Hussey or from Hussey in mm. particular is fascinating. And, you know, that 100 he made here in 2009 was a brilliant 100. Um, and it looked like the work of a, of a brilliant player, as he is, of course, a brilliant player. And yet what was going on under the surface is that he could barely rem remember how to hold a bat. He didn't want to be there. Just went out there and said, you know, fuck it, basically. Mm. I think that's the actual line in, in the piece. It is interesting. It actually reminds me of something I was listening to about footballers who come back uh, as reduced footballers, right? As reduced players, diminished players. They might have come back from a bad injury or whatever and... They've lost that yard of pace. You have it, of course, with cricket as well. And as a watcher, it requires a sort of psychological adjustment from our perspective as the fans, as we come to terms with this reshaped 
sports figure, this this heroic athlete person who who is showing their vulnerabilities, if you like, you know, and and how how we have to readjust our own parameters and our own expectations to reflect the fact that they're not quite as potent as they once were. But there's almost a kind of sort of there's a bit more sort of narrative to there, a bit more poetry to it. It was actually about Ronaldo, the the original Ronaldo, the proper Ronaldo and how we had to make our peace with it, if you like. But mm. that obviously massively, massively applies in cricket mm. in particular. I thought that... A bit like, sorry, a bit like Flintoff in that when he came back for that T20 campaign for Lancashire and he was sort of a, a bit part bigger sort of throughout it. And then it doesn't even play the semi-final, does he? And then was there an injury? So he comes into the final mm. and then they need loads of the last two overs and almost by sheer sort of aura and... and gets gets and belly out, doesn't he? Gets yeah. belly out in the but, final. But, but then, all, and then also he comes in with, uh, with the bat and he's, he's pushed down the order because, he, you know, he's not the player he once was, but just because he is this big moment player, it all kind of seems to sort of coalesce around him. They don't quite win it, but he's hitting last over sixes. And you kind of, you're almost surprised that this guy who hasn't played professional cricket in four years and, uh, and, and you know, is, is, is supposed to be a shadow of his former self, that he hasn't got them over the line. And that's the, the power of that kind of character, I guess. Yeah, it, it, I watched when it was the rain break in the Oval Test match, they showed the great 2003 Oval game here against South Africa and Thorpe's return when he's clearly a reduced player and a, a man who's, who, who has his own internal scars as well through his, through some tough times. Missed that Ashes tour, of course, at the time and all of that. But for him to return and to return and make 100 with a reconfigured sort of style, not nearly as flowing or fluent as he used to be. But there was a there was a, a completeness to that innings that, you know, as, as a consequence of the fact that he wasn't, that he'd gone through his, his, his problems. And, and there's something irresistible as a fan and you're watching that in sport. There's something particularly powerful and beautiful mm. about that. I think. And the psychology is fascinating. I thought the most interesting bit in the article was probably the stuff from Nick Compton about playing in New Zealand in 2013. So Andy Flower basically said, you're going to start the series, but you might not finish it, which is, uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure that's the best way to G someone off at the start of a series. And he, and he basically um, he had a conversation with a team psychologist who said, uh, if you won the lottery and the prize was batting for England one more time, how did what, how did go? And he said, yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd play my shots, etc." And that's what he does. And that's quite interesting. Like, that's from a relatively reserved player saying that and he said that three years down the line when he found himself in a similar position he tried to force himself into that philosophy but it wasn't very natural and it didn't really work as much he couldn't play a shot by that point i mm. mean his brain was completely gone by the time he got mm. it was about to get dropped for the second time that was actually quite painful to watch was it sri lanka that that series yeah the 20, home one here 2016 yeah. Yeah. yeah exactly that so i spoke to him about this um it was just one of these sort of junket things and it was at the Oval during the test match three or four years ago and he was there as a sort of guest of a sponsor and I, I was there as well. And he said the Chesterley Street game, which I think was maybe the second game of that early part of the summer, or maybe the first, can't remember. But anyway, he was batting against Sri Lanka in an actual test match as an England opener and he said, I literally didn't know how to stand there. And I was looking down at my stance and looking at my bat and my grip and thinking, is that how you meant? Is that how you're meant to do it? As... The test match bowlers running into bowl and there's 20,000 people watching you, you know. And, and I never forget that conversation because it's a little glimpse into into how much this game unhinges you. Mm. Yeah, I highly, highly recommend that article. You could probably find it on Cam Ponsonby's Twitter account. Yeah, good Twitter plug account. for Ponsonby, that. Um, Browsers. And to finish off, Joe, last week did a mag promo slot where we normally talk about all the this. things on the, in the magazine. And we did a really interesting bit in the main feature mm. But and Phil, Phil literally else. couldn't remember anything else. Okay, so. all right. Yet again, <laughs> misrepresented. Chose not to talk any more about the magazine, having done a nice 10 minutes. That's not Norm what you said normally, at the time. Yeah. That's not what you said at the time. I know, I know. I was being kind of cute. <laughs> normally, you're looking at your watch from about 10 minutes in, especially when I'm talking. You're always <laughs> looking at that little machine on your desk. That's because it's got the audio levels. Yeah, And it sure, also tells us sure, when the memory card's out. Sure. I'm if I, if I'd things. gone on any, any more about... You know, our, our nice little magazine, then you'd have shot me down anyway. Joe wasn't there. Normally, we sort of play it off against one another. Of course, I could remember some things. I mean, I'm in it. I remembered that bit anyway. Of course, I could remember lots of things. Well, Joe is here now. It's probably an Amsterdam has been put together. So. <laughs> I was in the other office here and you lot slagged me off about this the other day. Standard stuff. Joe. We knew you were next door, by the way. <laughs> they did. You did, of course, Joe. You always got my back. Um... What was the question? Wasn't that? <laughs> <laughs> C- 
can't remember. Um, <laughs> we, no, I can, I can, I can. Um, we've got an excellent interview with uh, Ed Smith, uh, former England selector, who's got a book out about the kind of the science, the mix of science and gut feel when it comes to selection. And there's some good insight in there about the logic behind picking certain players, how they get to that decision. It, it was actually, it was it really kind of combined nicely with the excellent interview that Mo Bobat did on Sky the other day about how the selection process works. I find it interesting that England are being so much more transparent about this stuff because it wasn't something they're prepared to talk about not so long ago. That is definitely worth a read. Um, we've got a nice piece by a freelance writer called Amir Malik uh, on Pakistanis and county cricket this summer. We've had, I think, is it 12 in the end? Might have got that slight. It's about that. So we've got a full team, basically. Mm. And he spoke to Nasim Shah, Hassan Ali and Shan Masood about their experience of county cricket, what it's like to, to play, but as much what it's like to be part of and the experience of the whole thing. Uh, there's some lovely lines in there. And it was a real, what I took from it particularly was how much reverence these guys have for county cricket based on what players like Wazi Makra and Wakar Yunus. Nasim Shah even said, well, I wanted to come here because I'd heard about what Wakar Yunus was doing for Surrey and Glamorgan when Nasim Shah probably wasn't alive wasn't born, not yeah. even close to being yeah. alive in fact <laughs> miles off being alive you could tell that yes in the commentary by the way Wazzy Macram on commentary every time a Lancashire played in anything he's like oh good old Lanks boy <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so it's a real it, it was a kind of a heartening piece to realise what county cricket still means in Pakistan and Shamasu was delighted to, to hear how well the county streams were going in Pakistan as well there is really that following out there mm. um, and they all want to come back we know Shamasu's coming back with Yorkshire Nassim Shah's spell at Gloucestershire didn't work out with injury and I think there was a family illness but uh, Gloucestershire said they'd be delighted to have him back as well. So that's that's quite a, a nice piece, a little bit different. Pakistan theme as well. John Stern did a yeah d- did a good hit on that brilliant, slightly, slightly chaotic tour post-Ashes in 05 where England, as Cox of the Walk, went out there thinking, oh, you know, well, we've just beaten the best team ever. Well, we'll stroll through this and got show of Akhtard, uh, over over three test matches, 2-0 result in the end. Uh, and he's spoken to a few players who were there and he's, he's lent on some, some second-hand accounts, but he's done it in a very, very good way. We do that really well in the magazine. He does it well, as in Joe. John does it very well as well. And it really does evoke the, uh, that, the, the, slight, the wildness of that tour, really. And... It was sort of the beginning of the end of that era. I know that they they continued to win Ashes stuff. Well, so they got stuffed in 067, but they you know they won the home the next two home Ashes tours, Ashes series, and of course one in ten eleven. But elsewhere they were they were beginning to fray at the edges a little bit. And the Vaughan era and the the Fred era as well, but those two shoulder to shoulder as symbols of that era, it was beginning to fall away by that point, really troscopic. That was the final tour a way tour that he completed he was brilliant incidentally with the bat on that and tour captain quite a bit because Vaughan was and injured. captain because Vaughan's knee was beginning to become terminally problematic for him so it's a really really evocative piece actually of, of, mm. of that of that series um and you remember again Shoaib in his pomp the things he he used to do so that's a good one uh and then just quickly the columnist Andrew Miller um tucks into the hundreds after a second edition which he he didn't think particularly caught light um we've got mark ramakash on the high performance review it's really good that uh and basically describing it as an old unsolvable riddle and he actually refers to the fact that he, uh, ramps's dad was a civil servant uh and he said his dad would always say it's it's not just the questions you're being asked it's the questions you're not being asked when it comes to putting together reports and, and he relates that to this high performance review which he thinks has come at it from the point of view of They've already decided they want to have fewer championship fixtures. They've already decided things that are important and they've asked questions that get the answers that they want, uh, which is quite, you know, I think there's there's some, certainly something in that. Um, and uh, Raph Nicholson addresses Lisa Kitely's departure and considers who might replace her. Since then, we've heard that Charlotte Edwards doesn't want the job. She's not ready for it. She's got other stuff going on. She's playing, coaching the Big Bash and, and Southern Vipers here. Um and Raf throws in a few, throws around a few names there. It'd be, it's a, it's a difficult job they've got deciding on who replaces Lisa Kitely. So we'll we'll watch this space to see who they go for. But I think Charlotte Edwards would have been considered the front runner. Mm. 
Absolutely. Um, as always, you can get the latest magazine from wisdom.com forward slash shop. Can I just quickly say thanks to the people who have written in regarding yes. the main feature? Yes. Uh, oh, we got we another spoke about last week. brilliant email mm. this morning. Superb, wasn't it? Mm. Yeah. And again, very gratifying. Uh, two things, actually. One that we've asked for responses to the hundred personal experiences of the hundred people who have attended games for a piece that we're doing for the following month, which has been great to see. That's actually a bit extraordinary. It has. Responses. And, you know, if the ECB wants some actual proper data-based research and, and anecdotal research as well, then, then we're doing their job for them. Um, and that will hopefully be combined into a thing that I'm trying to, to pull together for the next issue. But also responses to that feature that we spoke about last week about one's mm. own personal relationship with the game. The responses, again, have been really, really good. And it reminds us that you know, we're all swimming in the same soup here and mm. we're all trying our best to to make some sense of it, this thing that we cherish and love. Mm. And they have they have been great. People have got really into it. Some of them quite long. How we kind of represent these in the magazine, I'm not quite sure, but we will try and make sure that everyone's opinions are heard, whether that's putting them on the website. If we can't fit them in the magazine might be one solution. But um, yeah, do keep writing in. I promise you, we, we read all this stuff and it's hugely valued. The, the, the one today is better written than 95% of the stuff that, that we publish anyway. You can obviously edit that bit out, but it's, <laughs> it's, it's the, legitimately the, true. Is the 5% the stuff that the, what you write, Phil? Is that, the, is that how you figured out that ratio? I was thinking of you, sweetheart. Oh, thank you. Uh, I write any, more than 5%. Anyway, that is all we have time for today. Cheers, Phil. Cheers, Joe. Cheers, Ben. This has been the Wisdom Cricket Weekly Podcast. We'll be back next week.